by Tom Fowler. Tom was born and raised in Baltimore and still resides in Maryland. He's the author of the C.T. Ferguson Mysteries and the John Tyler Thrillers, both of which are set in his home city. At about age seven, polite young Tom wrote a murder mystery in which no one died. Uh, and the story gave him the writing bug, however, and he's been putting pen to paper and fingers to keys ever since. When not working or writing, Tom enjoys spending time with his family and friends, reading sports, movies, and writing brief bios in the third person. We all love writing our brief author bio in the third person, one of my favourite things to do. Uh, so, hi Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you and you can get started with your presentation. Hello, uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. That is true, when I was a kid I did write a uh, murder mystery um, in which no one actually died. Um, and I named the, um, well, I guess I can't really call him the killer. He didn't kill anybody. Um, uh, but the stabber, cause he stabbed people. I named him on the first page. So not a murder, not a mystery. Um, oh, for two. Uh, I, I'd like to think I've gotten better in the years since. <laughs> yeah. But Hey, I was like seven, you know, you'll learn. All right. Let me share my screen today. Uh, Zoom window out of here. Sorry for the weird camera angle. It's dubious whether I'm actually presentation ready, but uh, the room behind me is definitely not. So I put this in slideshow mode. Right. Can everyone see uh, the presentation? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I can't keep an eye on the chat very easily while I'm doing this. So Shane, please let me know if there's anything uh, in the chat that I need to know about. Uh, yeah, so hello cool. everyone welcome to uh writing mysteries and thrillers as shane said uh, my name is tom fowler today we're going to cover the basics of mysteries and thrillers uh important similarities and differences uh, they are often grouped together in your favorite bookstores uh, sometimes i'll use the acronym mts for mystery thriller and suspense in this that's how they're often um, bundled on amazon and you know even in barnes and Noble, you'll see like a mystery and thriller section so they're often bundled together, and they are very similar in many ways, but different in a few important ways as well. We'll talk about relevant subgenres, uh, not an exhaustive list, but it should hit most of the, the big ones. Uh, considerations for writing a series, and uh, while I am not a cover designer, uh, I'm a very poor artist, in fact, uh, I am happy to talk about some cover considerations uh, for when, when you or your cover artist of choice uh, is making a cover for your books. So who the heck am I? I've been doing this since uh, 2017, and the surprise emoji is there because it was October of 2017, so it's actually six years now. Oh my gosh. Uh, in that time, um, 20 novels across my two series, and you can see a few of the covers there, uh, six novellas, uh, a few box sets. Um, I don't even know how many box sets, actually. Uh, I've talked about writing thrillers uh, when Shane's pop podcast, the Write Better Fiction podcast, uh, the Rebel Author podcast with Sasha Black, uh, and a couple other ones over the past couple of years as well. So let's dive into the basics. Um, thrillers need to be thrilling. Mysteries need to be mysterious. That's my time today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Okay, we're going to go into a little more detail than that. Uh, at their core, both of them are adventure stories. Uh, and the things which make a good mystery or thriller, you can often find in other genres. There are sci-fi thrillers. Um, I think The Martian is probably a good example of that. You can have fantasy mysteries. Um, you can have romantic suspense. So any, anything that makes a story, and we'll talk about things that can make something a good mystery or a good thriller, don't have to be confined to just those two genres. You can use those in other, in other genres as well. So some key elements. Uh, you need a strong story hook to pull readers in. Something significant has to happen. If somebody steals a sandwich from the 7-Eleven. That is not the basis for a mystery story. It, it just doesn't matter enough. Um, similarly, there are high stakes to keep the tension up. The world itself doesn't have to be on the line, but something significant has to be on the line for the hero or heroine to get involved and for the characters to to do everything. And those characters need to be complex. They need to be believable. Your pacing should be appropriate. Thrillers tend to be faster paced than mysteries. Not always, but that's a, a general guideline. 
uh, clues, red herrings, plot twists, particularly for mysteries, those can be important. Uh, setting uh, is big, atmosphere. Um, setting is often another character or can be like another character, even if it's done well. And a satisfying conclusion. That does not always mean um, that the good guys win unscathed, but the conclusion itself should be satisfying to the story. It's not advancing for some reason. There we go. Oh, my Zoom thing is in the way here. Let me move this. Okay. Uh, so the hook, the premise of the story itself needs to be compelling. Like I said, no one cares if the corner store gets robbed. Um, but if, you know, five people are murdered at the country club, that's the basis of a story. Uh, the stakes need to be relevant and high, but fitting for the story. Um, you know, Blofeld doesn't have to steal the magic space rockets or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, the Bond plots are always kind of ridiculous. Um, but something has something significant has to be on the line for the hero or heroine to risk um, usually loss of life um, in the story. And characters matter. Obviously, plot does too. But readers need to be able to connect with your main character and uh, understand your villain. Probably loathe the villain at the same time, but also understand them. Uh, pacing. Uh, fast when it needs to be, uh, especially in, like in an action scene or a fight scene. Um, but also you can slow it down in spots. Readers need to be able to take a breath. You can't always have your foot to the floor 100% of the time. Uh, like I mentioned, mysteries are often a little slower paced because the story has to unfold. Uh, the main character has to discover clues and put things together. So they're a little slower than thrillers normally. But just, you know, you can't be all action all the time. Um, for mysteries, clues uh, and red herrings, which are false clues, are usually important. Plot twists are nice to have. Um, and as a brief aside, I really hate book covers where it's like, a shocking twist you won't see coming. I might actually see it coming, so don't presume that. But, you know, it's nice to have a plot twist, but you shouldn't don't have one just because that's popular to do. You know, don't force one into the story. Um, the setting should be important. Uh, why is the story set in New York, in Los Angeles, in Baltimore, in small town Maine, wherever it is? And a satisfying conclusion, like I said, not necessarily a happy ending for everyone involved. Um, the good guys can take some losses along the way, but the conclusion of the story should be satisfying from where it started. And here are a few memorable protagonists from across the mystery and thriller spaces. Some of these you've probably read, uh, read in books or seen on uh, even on TV and the movies, as a lot of them have been adapted um, for other media as well. And not meant to be, There's a, this list could be pages and pages and pages long. These are just the ones that came to mind. So my own characters. Uh, for my mystery series, this is the most recent uh, completed book. Um, C.T. Ferguson is not a former cop or a former military. He is a hacker by trade. Um, he's also not, you know, someone who's struggling to pay their rent every month. You know, his wealthy parents... Uh, as the series opens, his wealthy parents compel him to get a job helping people if he wants access to the family money. And so he strikes out as a private investigator in his home city of Baltimore. Um, the stories are, they're, they're traditional mysteries, but there's a cyber savviness to them because of his background. He's very sarcastic. He often makes jokes. Um, he always thinks he's the smartest person in the room. Sometimes he is. Um, he does hate it when people try to wield some kind of power or status over him. Uh, he's a bit younger than a lot of mystery protagonists in that he's 28 uh, as the series opens. Uh, he ages mostly in real time. In the book I'm writing now, he's about to turn 33. So he's aged five years in six years. That's pretty close. Um, I, when I set out to create this character, uh, I, I really set out to do, made a list of things I didn't want him to be or to have. Uh, and I was watching a lot of shows like Monk and Psych and The Mentalist. So I was like, okay, well, I can't have a guy with a photographic memory because well, that's been done. I didn't want the grizzled ex-cop with the heart of gold. You know, I love Spencer and, and characters like that, but I didn't want to go that route either. I don't necessarily recommend building your characters this way because you're going to make a list of things you don't want versus a list of things you do. Um, but I, I did eventually come around to some things I wanted him to to do and to have. Um, 
And that book there, Concrete Angels, is the 14th in the series. I'm writing the 15th now for release later this year. So thankfully, more people than me actually like them. Uh, my other series protagonist is John Tyler. This is the most recent uh, Tyler book there. He is a retired Green Beret, also released from a, a retired rather from a private security gig that he worked for a few years after he retired from the Army. As the series opens, uh, he's age 50 uh, and he's 52 now, so he's pretty close to real time. I published the first Tyler book in 2020. Uh, his original uh, job in the Army was a mechanic, a wheeled, ve wheeled vehicle mechanic in particular. So all the series titles uh, relate in some way both to the plot and to driving or cars. Uh, he lives with his teenage daughter and with PTSD, uh, which he manages with a therapeutic program in the books. Uh, he's not necessarily book smart, where someone like C.T. Ferguson is, but Tyler is tactically smart. Uh, he's very practical. He will do what he has to do to, to finish the mission, if you will. Uh, and he, he'd be happy not to have to play hero or shoot people, but he also can't walk away from trouble. And those are the big things that define uh, those characters. So as you're creating your own characters, uh, you should come up with some positive things about them, things you want them to be or do or have. And also some things you don't want them to be like when I didn't want CT to, you know, be a grizzled ex cop or have a photographic memory, which was very popular at the time. Uh, see if we have any questions in the chat. I don't know if I can see it very well. Uh, how long do you need to go from idea to publishing state for a novel? Um, I'll come back to my routine. Uh, maybe at the end, Shane, please remind me of that. Uh, Ingrid, I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, but how long to go from idea to publishing state is really going to vary from person to person. My first book, uh, The Reluctant Detective, I would say took over six years from the time I first started writing it to the time I published it in October of 2017. Now I can turn titles around in three or four months. Um, just I, I've gotten a lot better, uh, hopefully better as a writer, but certainly better in my own process over time. I do things faster. Uh, than I used to, which comes with experience. So how long you need is really, I mean, that's going to vary from person to person. Uh, Nikki asks, did I always plan these as series or were they standalones with more story to tell? Uh, I did always plan them as series. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what goes into a series later. But yes, I did plan them both to be series, uh, open-ended, so I don't have a, they're not going to end after X books or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have some, um, I have, I, mean, I didn't necessarily have an overarching plan for the series, but I do have some plots which span multiple books in both. Uh, okay, M more questions. That's cool. Uh, Laura says, did you publish uh, first books originally with an agent? Uh, no, I've been in you the whole time. Uh, I tried to do the agent route with some short stories years ago. They probably weren't very good, but I probably wasn't very good back then. Um, but I, I didn't find uh, an agent or anything like that. This was probably, gosh, two, mid 2000s, let's say, something like that. Um, so when I was getting serious about publishing again around 2015, 2016, um, I decided to go into the whole way. All right, let um, me close the chat for now. Oh, oops, back. There we go. So uh, this case, you didn't see the title slide. Important similarities and differences between uh, mysteries and thrillers. So similarities. There is some central conflict that drives the story. That's a murder. That's a kidnapping. That's, you know, MI6 has been robbed of the secret documents or whatever it is. Something drives the story forward. Something compelling drives the protagonist against the antagonist. And they're going to struggle over whatever this conflict is. Um, speaking of the protagonist, you have to have a strong, memorable character. The stakes have to be high, or at least relevant for the story. You know, the world isn't necessarily ending, but they have to be important. Hidden information, um, that's going to be a similarity and a difference. There's always going to be information the protagonist doesn't know. But usually, um, in thrillers, the reader does know that information. And in mysteries, the protagonist does not know the information. And it's hidden from the reader as well. Maybe there's like a clue hidden somewhere that you, the reader, are expected to pick up on. But the author is not going to come out and tell you, this person is a suspect. This guy did it. You know, that's for you to, to figure out as the story unfolds. So that's what I mean by hidden information. 
but the protagonist of the stories is usually of something that they need to know. They will need to know later, certainly. Uh, setting should matter. There are usually deeper themes at play, justice, morality are common. Uh, we have plot elements like clues, false clues, and twists, and usually a memorable supporting cast. If you watched, um, I was pretty young when this was on, but I, I, it's also Alan DVD, the Spencer for Hire TV series from the 80s. Then you remember the great Avery Brooks as Hawk. Um, now, maybe Hawk is partially a great character because of that performance on the small screen, but he is a memorable supporting character regardless. So some key differences. Mysteries are often about the process of solving a crime. Thrillers are usually about righting a wrong. Uh, one is a whodunit. One is, can I make whoever did it pay for it? Uh, like I mentioned, hidden information uh, in mysteries, readers tend to learn along with the protagonist. Uh, and thrillers usually have, uh, readers usually have information the protagonist does not. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is mysteries tend to be written in the first person where you as the reader get to solve along with the main character and get to learn the clues that he or she sees or doesn't see. Uh, and in thrillers, that's often third person because we'll get some scenes from the villain's point of view and other characters as well. Uh, pacing. Um, thrillers tend to be more of a sprint, not always, uh, but mysteries, you know, the story has to unfold. The protagonist has to uncover clues along the way. Um, they might identify the wrong suspect at first because of a couple of red herrings. Uh, the protagonist's role usually differs a little bit. Uh, in mysteries, the protagonist tends to be solving a puzzle. Uh, in thrillers, they are usually in survival mode, at least part of the time, because there's some kind of life or death struggle going on. Uh, the scope in thrillers is usually bigger, like spy thrillers can be, you know, jet setting continents, several continents around the world. Uh, mysteries can occur in a single locked room. So the scope or the, the, the setting is much smaller there. And in terms of level of violence, neither needs to be overly violent, um, but thrillers do tend to use it more, uh, at least more frequently. Uh, let's check the chat for questions now as we're doing another section. Uh, <laughs> yes, maybe Randy does have a cat. <laughs> have I ever been tempted to write a cozy mystery, Anna asks. Um, honestly, no, it's not my bag. Um, I appreciate them for what they are. I enjoy reading them sometimes, but it's never something I've really been uh, interested in writing. Uh, and asked, do I use a structure like save the cat? Uh, I will come back to my process uh, at the end. Shane, again, please remind me of that. Yes, I do use something like save the cat and a few other things as well. It's a, probably a complicated process that I'm not necessarily going to recommend for every, everyone else, but uh, it works for me. Uh, where do I get my ideas from, Laura asks. Oh, anywhere. Um, news stories, um, things I hear, things I hear people say um, sometimes I just get a scene in my head uh, or a title, uh, my thriller four on the floor. Um, again, doing double duty because it's a car term and a plot term. Um, but like I, I just have the idea of four on the floor, which for those who don't know the car term was the term for an old four speed manual transmission. Um, and I came up the, the entire plot just kind of came to me from there. So really ideas can come from anywhere. Uh, do you have any police or detective giving advice for scenes or cases? I've talked to a couple of police officers over time, uh, especially as I've been in, I don't live in Baltimore now, but as I've gone into the city and I've seen police officers around, I've asked them some questions about things. Uh, that's mostly so I can get like the, the structure of the Baltimore police department, right? Uh, because while my mystery is the protagonist is a PI, the police are involved. His cousin, uh, is a homicide lieutenant. So the police are involved in the stories. Um, but I have a few books that go over police procedural. So I, I often can consult those or I'll just look something up online if I need to know like a procedural detail. But you know, I'm not writing police procedural. So if I fudge the details a little bit, I'm okay with that. I, I want to tell a story and the cops aren't the focus and, the, and how, they, how the cops do things is not the focus of the stories I'm telling. 
Okay, uh, close the chat for now. Uh, relevant subgenres. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. So if I miss the one you write, please don't take offense. Um, cozy mysteries tend to see amateur sleuths, small towns, very little violence or cursing. Uh, they were clean to use the romance term. Um, Murder, she wrote, is a good example here. The Miss Marple story is um, Murder, she wrote. How many murders did that small town have? Gosh, like 180 or something like that. Tom Bosley must have been the worst cop ever because he needed Angela Lansbury to solve all his cases. I watched that show with my grandparents back in the day. Um, <laughs> Hard boiled, um, you know, the Spencer novels are a good example here. Gritty, um, a good amount of action, snappy dialogue. Um, police procedurals actually focus on how police solve crimes. So I don't write procedurals, but if you do, you really want to know how those things work because attention to detail matters there. Uh, you can have legal and courtroom mysteries. Um, major scenes and plot points will be resolved in court. Like The Lincoln Lawyer is a popular show on Netflix recently. Uh, that would be a good example of a legal mystery. Um, your protagonists tend to be lawyers or judges or their investigators. Uh, a caper. Um, this is where we pull off, where the heroes pull off uh, something complex, some massive um, scheme, often with some humor. Ocean's Eleven and its sequels are, are good examples there. A locked room mystery. Um, how did a murder happen in this? Doesn't necessarily have to be a locked room, but in some small isolated setting. Um, a private island that's hosting an event and the guests start dropping dead. That's another example of a locked room mystery, even though it's not a locked room per se. Uh, and historical, um, your, your, your traditional mystery thriller elements, but set in specific periods. And we blend those historical elements with the elements we come to expect from a mystery. For thrillers, um, oh, I, I do want to touch on cozy mysteries. There are some, there were several sub genres there. There's like paranormal cozies where like the protagonist gets help from their aunt who's a ghost or something like that there's cat cozies um, there are culinary cozies where the protagonist is a a chef or a restaurant owner or something like that so cozy itself is a big subgenre which has its own sub subgenres so even though these are subgenres of mystery they themselves can be pretty big so for thrillers uh, psychological thrillers tends to focus on like emotional states emotional damage past trauma and events, which in some way relate to the plot of the present day. Uh, a military thriller, like your Jack Reacher stories, the protagonist is current or former military. Uh, in espionage, we have spies and covert operatives, usually on some jet setting international stage, often with different locales. You know, Bond might start in England, go to Prague, and then go to Brazil. You know, they can happen all over the world. Action thrillers, um, fast paced, the emphasis is on physical action and you know feats of daring do and heroism. Medical thrillers usually center around some breakthrough in the medical field um, that usually someone wants to keep under wraps. Um, doctors, researchers, nurses, nurses are often your protagonists. Techno thrillers uh, often explore the dark side of emerging technology. Usually it is run amok or is posing a danger. You know, Skynet from the Terminator universe would be a, an, an antagonistic force there. Um, political thrillers, the protagonist who is often some kind of a uh, reporter or like a junior Capitol Hill staffer has to contend with uh, some government conspiracy. Uh, disaster thrillers, uh, you know, man versus nature. The main conflict is against the tornado or the earthquake or the building that's going to collapse or whatever. Uh, and supernatural, our protagonists battle against um, dark forces of a supernatural nature. And you can have supernatural mysteries. I mean, this is, it doesn't just have to be a thriller, but these are that's where it's more commonly seen. Okay, let's go back to chat. Um, uh, do I have a military background, uh, Ingrid asks? No, I don't. Uh, I did work for the Army and the Department of Defense for about 16 years. So uh, I learned a lot there as a, as a civilian and a contractor. So I know several people who are or were in the Army. Uh, my editor um, was in the Army. He was actually a marksman and firearms instructor. So um, if there's a detail I get wrong about a gun, he always knows and he always corrects me. Uh, so there are people I can ask about that, uh, about those kind of things. 
Uh, is there something like a blended mystery thriller or thriller mystery, Gene asks. Uh, there is. I mean, there's enough overlap between the two that, you know, most mysteries have thriller elements in them, and most thrillers have some kind of mystery elements in them already. How do I handle my protagonist's arc in each book? Does he have transformation or stay pretty much the same like a Reacher type character? Uh, Gaston asks. Um, I, I think he, particularly in the mystery series, CT grows over time. Over the course of 14 books, you can very easily chart his growth from one to 14 uh, on a macro level. I think he does experience moments of growth in individual books throughout the series. So I think he does change, he does grow. And that's one of the things readers have liked about the series because he, he's a little bit of a jerk in the first book, if I'm being honest. Um, and that that gets de that that aspect of his personality, I think, becomes less so over time. Uh, I think he's definitely uh, grown a lot. Um, Tyler is probably, a, I, th I think he has grown some as well, uh, but I think he is probably a little more static just because he's older um, and maybe a little more set in his ways than someone like CT is. All right, so series. So here are some examples uh, from across the mystery thriller landscape of successful series. Um, the Spencer books, Jack Reacher, Kinsey Milhone, um, Bosch, Poirot, Miss Marple, the in-death series by Nora Roberts, writing as J.D. Robb. So things that strong mystery thriller, uh, mystery series and thriller series will have in common, a protagonist. You have to have a strong protagonist. People have to want to keep reading the Jack Reacher books or the Spencer books or the in-death series. And they're not if the protagonist isn't strong and doesn't matter. Uh, a good supporting cast. Um, the setting has to matter even if it's not consistent. You know, one of the key things about the Jack Reacher books is they don't have a consistent setting. He moves around a lot. But the setting always matters in the story somehow, even though it's it's never the same or it's rarely the same from book to book. Tone and style should be consistent across books. Uh, you can have minor characters recur throughout the series. Um, I had a character appear in book six who later becomes um, CT's secretary um, at the end of book 10, beginning of book 11. So her role expands, but she was a minor character in book six. Those characters can recur over time. You can have multi-book story arcs. Uh, and as the series continues, you do need to have some fresh scenarios, introduce some new characters, maybe some new settings over time, just to keep things interesting and to keep readers guessing. Uh, some more commonalities. Um, every book needs to be accessible for new readers. Uh, if that's the first one of your series, if it's book 15 of your series, it's the first one they've read, they should be able to pick it up and know who's who and what's happening. Uh, that said, you can include some Easter eggs for longtime readers, people who've been with you from the beginning who will recognize certain things and certain elements. Um, your openings and conclusions should be strong. Start the story strong, finish it strong to keep people coming back. Um, whereas fantasy and other genres, you know, fantasy is defined by trilogies for the most part, um, but certainly closed series, series of a fixed number. Uh, that can even be up to like 14, like The Wheel of Time, I think was 14 books. Uh, but mystery and thriller series tend to be open-ended. Um, Lee Child's brother is going to continue the Reacher series, I think, after two more books. Lee Child's going to retire. Um, the Spencer series, Robert B. Parker died in 2010. Uh, and since then, there have been 12 more books written in the Spencer series, I think. Um, originally by Ace Atkins, now by Mike Lupica. Um, but it's an open-ended series. The series has survived the author. Cover considerations. Again, I am not a cover artist, so please don't take this as I have designed X number of best-selling covers. If you gave me two dots, I might be able to draw a straight line between them, but that's about the limit of my talents as an artist. Uh, argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours, but that's true. So here are three covers um, that I found. So why do all three of these psychological thrillers have a blue background, some shade of blue, yellow letters, and a scene either of a house or from a house? Because it clearly tells the reader what the genre is. And that is the number one job of your cover, whether you're designing it yourself, if you have those skills, or whether you're paying someone to do it for you. The number one job of the cover 
is to say this is a psychological thriller this is a cozy mystery this is a military thriller whatever it is the designer again whether that's you or someone else should be someone who understands the look the mood the tropes the typography font matters too uh, of covers in your genre or in your niche here are um, some of my covers from my john tyler thriller series uh, those are the first four books in the series actually let me go back in case you need a second to look over them and again i did not design these because i am a dreadful artist so your books your individual title should have a consistent look and feel across the books um, they should all evoke the genre or subgenre you write in um, you can have branding elements um, fonts a recurring image a color scheme Maybe at, maybe you're writing uh, books set in uh, DC and you have the Jefferson Memorial in the back of, of all your books or something like some some branding element that, that people can look at and recognize. Oh, this is a book by author X, and the book should look distinct. You know, like all of these look distinct on their own, but they do look related as well because they are part of a series. They're all standalone stories, but they're part of a series. So let me see if there's any question in the chat. Uh, do you borrow ideas? Oh, there's a few questions coming in. Okay. Uh, Gaston, do you borrow ideas from other memorable characters for your protagonist's personalities? Um, subconsciously, I'm sure I do. I, I don't set out to write the next Jack Reacher or whatever. Um, interestingly, though, when I was coming up with the concept for for John Tyler, it was my thought process, because Reacher is the 800 pound gorilla, if you're writing military action thrillers, was, you know, what if Jack Reacher had a house, a job, and a teenage daughter? And the very obvious answer is he wouldn't be Jack Reacher anymore, um, because the Reacher series is, and the character is defined by not having those things. Uh, but he might be someone like Harry Bosch. Um, and one of my readers, after I published, I think it was the second book, uh, White Lines, um just and, and that's not a something that i shared with people that i that that was my initial thought process um just said wow you know tile is a great combination of of reacher and bosch and i was like yes it's exactly what i had in mind but it, does he have elements of those characters in his personality inevitably because i've read those books and i've seen those tv shows and things like that but i didn't set out to to evoke those when i was writing him if that makes sense it made sense in my head Things often make sense in my head that may not when I say them out loud. Uh, since you can start any book in the series, is there enough backstory in each book and is it differently written? Uh, how do you prevent it from getting boring? Um, Ingrid asked that. Um, basically, the first time we meet a character in a book, we get a very brief description. Um, doesn't have to be long, just, you know, the first time we meet Cousin Rich in a CT book. We get a very, you know, a couple of sentences that he's a police lieutenant and, you know, he's short haired and he wears the same suit every Tuesday. So it must be gray suit day or whatever. Just something that gives you a couple little nuggets about him. Um, and if you're a new reader, you can get a picture of him in your head. And if you're an old reader, he's a familiar character. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in not stopping the story once you've started it. So I don't want to spend three paragraphs, you know, my cousin Rich is a police lieutenant in the Baltimore, blah, 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 and he's worked X number of cases, and he's seven years older than me, and da, 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 that's going to stop the story, and readers will just lose interest at that point, um, but if it's something you can cover very quickly in like a couple of sentences, or, you know, two or three sentences, I think that's fine, that's what I try to do, just hit it quickly and and get on with with the story, so that's hopefully how I prevent it from getting boring for people who have read um multiple books uh, we had a question earlier uh, two questions i think about process and save the cat and stuff like that shane you were supposed to remind me. bad shane um my process is, is <laughs> i mean it, it, it's probably unique uh i do use save the cat um the i used to be a a, a pantser uh someone who wrote without an outline or who writes by the seat of their pants uh and in my third mystery novel i kind of wrote myself into a corner um 
And I was like, God, I'm not sure how to, and I knew how I wanted the story to end. I knew the 95% point, but I was stuck at 70, 75%. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to bridge that gap. So I followed the advice that is popularly attributed to Raymond Chandler. And that is, if you're ever unsure of what to do, have a man walk in with a gun. Works very well in mystery and thriller. Uh, if you write other genres, you know, you can adapt it, you know, no guns necessarily in medieval fantasy, but have someone walk in with a sword, I guess. The key is challenge your protagonist, force them to get out of a tough situation. And that's what I did. And I was able to move the story along uh, and get it to the ending that I had in mind. But I also realized I couldn't keep going back to this well. Like at the 75% mark of every book, someone can't walk into the office with a gun. It's going to become ridiculous at that point. So there's a very good book out there called Take Off Your Pants, which is also a great title for a book by Libby Hawker. I'll put her name here in the chat. Uh, it's called Take Off Your Pants. It's about um, how to start doing outlines if you're a pantser when you write. And the five things she mentions you need are a protagonist, an antagonist, um, the struggle between them. Oh, God. I, 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 I got to remember these now. They struggle. Uh, um, there's some resolution, and the hero either wins or loses. Doesn't always have to win. Um, so I started doing that like five step thing, those five key points. There you go. Thank you, Nikki, there's a link to it. And I also started using Save the Cat beat sheets. You can find blank beat sheets. Uh, if you read the books, um, Save the Cat, or Save the Cat writes a novel, since we're novelists mostly, um, you can find blank beat sheets, like Excel beat sheets you can fill in online. You, know, you plug in your, oh, I'm gonna write an 80,000 word book and it tells you, oh, inciting incident at 8,000 words or whatever it is. Um, so I usually fill one of those out too, because I always have a bunch of things I know I want to have happen in the story. Like I have a list of plot points and events and things like that. And then I use, um, the save the cat beat sheet. I use the Libby Hawker's method and I plug all that stuff into plotter, which is, um, software for windows and Mac that helps you, uh, like visualize an outline and put it together. And I dump that into Scrivener. Um, and Scrivener's the tool I use to write in. Uh, but you can export it, Plotter into Word also. You don't even have to use a tool like Plotter if you don't want. It's just something that helps me visualize things. Um, this is why I say my process is perhaps not repeatable for other people. Um, the key, I think, is to find a process that works for you. Um, however simple or convoluted that is. Mine, you might think mine is terribly dreadful and convoluted. Uh, my outlines tend to be about three to four pages or so. Um, I went to the 20, I think it was 2017, Maryland Writers Association Conference and Jeffrey Deaver, um, author of a Bone Collector and a bunch of zillion other books, was the keynote speaker. And he mentioned that his outlines are 150 pages long. Now, to me, my, my books, you know, if, you're, if we're talking like single space, 12 point font and word are about 150 pages long. So I'm part time, you know, I have a day job. I don't have time to write a book before I write a book. He does, good for him, he's full-time. And it, obviously this process works for him because Jeffrey Deaver has sold a trillion books. It would not work for me. My process may not work for you, or it might, you're free to try it. But if you have one that does work for you, I absolutely encourage you to stick with it, no matter how unique it may be. Uh, let's see if I've missed any questions. Uh, are you... Hang on. I'm stuck scrolling up here. So the next question was from Gaston said, are you planning to use AI or get uh, to get to help you outline your next novel or any other part of your process? Uh, I have actually have started using it uh, in the outlining stage. Um, I will uh, come up with uh, a list of characters and story events. And I will ask uh, both Chet, GPT, and Claude to do a six-stage outline, the Michael Haig story structure, and a Save the Cat beat sheet. I also do my own. Um, but these, these tools, I don't want to say they think of things, so they don't think, but uh, I'll use that term. They come up with things that I would not think of. And they take the story in directions I would not necessarily go. Some of those are unusable and ridiculous. Um, Claude, in particular, will 
will just run the Olympic mile with something you give it unless you rein it in. Um, but those those are often useful uh, in, in getting another perspective on my outline and my beat sheet and things like that. Um, so I do use I do use those tools for that. Yes. Okay, awesome. Laura's question. Next one was, uh, what's the max word count we should go for? Um, yeah, the, the range usually is and cozies, maybe a little bit shorter on average and around 60 or so. And then you have, uh, you know, your political thrillers and things like that can be up to a hundred or maybe a little bit more. So something in the 60 to a hundred K range. But I mean, you know, this, I know this is not necessarily a helpful answer, but the story is as long as it needs to be, right? If you can tell it in 70,000 words, great. Uh, my mysteries tend to be 67 to 74 in that range. Um, and the thrillers tend to be in the 74 to 80 range, uh, which is a touch shorter than the average, but that's, that's the length I write to. Um, that's as long as the stories are. Um, if you're going well over a hundred, a hundred thousand words, um, that that's going to be longer than typical than, than normal. Again, that 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 might be what you need for the story. Uh, Jean asked, "Do you have multiple stories in various stages, or just focus on one at a time as you write?" Uh, I only write one at a time. Um, but I do often have ideas for other stories and I just have a file on my computer that I add those ideas to. Uh, and sometimes I flesh them out as I get them. Sometimes it's just like, oh, here's a cool idea. And I just put that one thing in there. Sometimes it's, here's a cool idea and eight other things that go along with it. Cause that, that's what I was thinking about in the shower that morning for no reason at all. Um, so that goes in there too. Um, but I'm only ever writing one thing at a time because my brain just doesn't, do like i can't I, I can't write more than one thing at a time um it's common that i am sometimes re going through um, revisions of one story as i'm writing another and for whatever reason i can keep those things separate um but trying to write two stories i, I think my head would explode <laughs> yeah definitely i agree and nikki said can you talk a bit more about plotter because she is a pantser uh, yeah, Plotter is uh, it's a tool. I think it's a web app now, too, if you go on the pro version. Um, but it's for Windows and Mac. And basically, you can populate a timeline. Let me see. Uh, let me stop sharing for a minute. I'll see if I can find one um, while I'm talking. Um, and I'll just. And once you have that. I, I go by chapter and see, you know, I have, oh yeah, I have chapters across the top of the page, you know, one to however many, and then, you know, scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. Uh, and then it's just a little short um, explanation or blurb about what happens in each scene. So while I am technically a plotter by those definitions, um, there's also a significant amount of pantsing involved because I have a three sentence summary for a scene uh, you know, and I'm turning that into, you know, 800 or a thousand words or however long the scene is. So there's a, a fair bit of pantsing going on there too. Let me see if I can find a plotter document here. Um, this is like the action adventure plot, which is kind of the beat sheet I have overlaid here. Um, and as you can see, there are chapters going across of the top out to 51 or however many were in here. And these are the main story threads. Uh, Tyler takes on the corrupt officials. Uh, his daughter, Alexi, is, is uh, in college. She's a, high school, a senior in high school as the series opens in this book. She's in college. Uh, then we have scenes from the villain's perspective. Uh, and a few times we recruit some allies to the cause. So, you know, I have different scenes broken down by which plot, which uh, mean or A, B, or C story, I guess you could say, they serve. Um, Apparently, I left a lot of beats in there that I wasn't using. Um, but there are chapters in there, too. And these are the, This is just a pre-filled uh, template, which you don't have to use. You can make your own from scratch. I just use that to kind of give me an overlay and stay on track. This is Save the Cat one out there now, too, that I don't think was out there when I when I used this one. 
Uh, but it's just a good way for me to visualize um, the main and the sub, uh, the B plot and keep everything kind of lined up chapter and scene. Uh, what you can then do, uh, uh, sorry, zoom is in the way here. Um, but you can, oh, sorry, I have an update to run, but you can export this, um, I, or I could save as a template. You can export it into Scrivener uh, if you write in Scrivener. And if you do that, then the, your little scene capsules will come up in the description of the core board. Um, or you can export it into Word, uh, whatever you write in. Uh, for me, an outline is, it's not set in stone. Like, you know, I live in the DC suburbs of Maryland. If I wanted to drive to Los Angeles, I know I have to get in my car and go west. Um, but I, I need to know more than that to get there, or I'm probably going to get lost. So it's really a kind of a road roadmap from the beginning of the story to the end but inevitably something happens that i you know i have to add a scene i rearrange a couple things um you know it's it's not something that's ironclad and set in stone you know just like if you're driving across the country oh here's the spam museum or whatever let me go see that or here's this cool restaurant my brother said i should try so you detour there you know same thing for me it's, it's a roadmap but i can take detours i can move things around if need be Awesome. Does anyone have any other questions? Tom? Let's see. Uh, I see here. Carolyn says, since you have a job or an author, when do you find time to write? <laughs> uh, gosh, stolen moments. Um, you know, before before COVID, um, my job was a mix. I have um, two days in the office and three days at home. Uh, and my wife was a teacher, so she was in the classroom every day. So uh, my writing time was mostly the time between like the time I got home and my daughter got home from school uh, and my wife got home. And depending on whether I was in the office or, or at home, anyway, that was one to two hours every day. And that was my dedicated time to write and do all the other things we have to do. Um, and then, you know, COVID hit and everyone was home all the time. And my magical one to two hours was totally gone. Um, and has not come back because my job has been remote um, and, you know, things have changed. So that, that writing time has not come back. So a lot of it is stolen moments, um, you know, before work, at lunch, on work, after work. Um, in the mornings on weekends, I'm usually the first one up so I can get an hour or two in there. Um, you know, but one of the things I think that's beneficial to realize is if you say you want to write for an hour a day, you know, if you are an adult with a day job and kids and responsibilities and things like that, because adulting is hard, right? You're probably not going to have 60 continuous minutes. So if you have four blocks of 15 minutes, use those. Uh, if you have three blocks of 20 minutes, uh, you know, getting up an hour earlier isn't feasible for some people. You're probably getting up early as it is. Staying up an hour later may not be feasible. Uh, and those are common pieces of advice, but they just don't work for people all the time. Um, so it, it's really about finding time in your day. Yes, maybe you have 20 minutes before work. Or if you take the train to work, like um, Mark Dawson, who's a, a prominent uh, thriller author, said you know, he used to ride the, the tube in London to work every day. We call it the subway. They call it the tube Um every day and he was on the train for like an hour and a half or two hours or whatever it was and that was his writing time because he couldn't do it at work but he had two hours a day he was on the train and that was his writing time um you know maybe you're not on the train for two hours a day but you know if you can find 15 minutes here 15 minutes there um that's all useful i also um it feels a little weird at first but writing on your phone can help too uh, if you use Scrivener, there is an iOS version. I don't think there's one for Android, but I know there's one for iOS. Uh, an iOS version of Scrivener. I think it's 20 bucks. It syncs with Dropbox. Um, Google Docs, though, is free. Um, Apple Notes, Evernote, whatever you know, whatever you use for stuff like that. Because um, you can always just you know cut and paste it and email it to yourself, and then paste it back into your Word document if you want to write in Apple Notes on your phone. Whatever you know, whatever process works, whatever tools you use. Um, but have the ability to, you know, if you're stuck in a long line at the grocery store and, you know, because there's never enough cashiers open at the grocery store and I don't use self-checkout because the price I pay for groceries includes the employees. So I'm not going to give them a break and check out my own groceries. So I'm going to stand in the line. And if you have 10 or 15 minutes, 
you know, take out your phone and here's a couple of lines of dialogue or here's a, you know, an opening scene to something. You know, find those stolen moments. They really help because adulting is hard. And especially if you have a job and kids, you probably don't have a big block of time in your schedule very often. Hopefully that helped. And I think most people are bits of plotter and pantser. To me, it's a spectrum. And there are people at the very, very far ends, like Jeffrey Deaver, in this 150 page outline, he is at the very far end of the plotter spectrum. Um, people like Stephen King, um, Joanna Penn, or famous uh, discovery writers or, or pantsers. So they would be at the far end of the pantsing uh, end of the spectrum. But for most people, most people I think fall somewhere in the middle. Great. Um, Laura asks, what tools do you use for formatting your books? Uh, I use Vellum. Uh, it is Mac only. Uh, you can use Mac and Cloud on Windows. Um, there, there are people who have bought like older Macs just to be able to run Vellum. Uh, it's really, really um, it's not as powerful as something like um, like Adobe InDesign, but you're trading that power for much, much, much greater ease of use. Um, once I have a, a finished book, I can dump it into Vellum and I can churn out an ebook, uh, a print version and a large print paperback in, you know, a few minutes, you know, import the story, import the book cover, add front and back matter, export, and it's pretty much done. Um, I use, there, there are different styles or themes where I forget that I think Vellum calls them styles and I use a different one for the thrillers versus the mystery. So I just have to make sure I have the right one set. Uh, depending on what book it is but really it's just you know import the book make sure i have everything set make sure the front and back matters there plug in the copyright notice and stuff like that and um you know just generate the books uh, atticus is a good tool um that works uh on windows and mac and i think it's it's a web tool it should probably work on chromebooks too um there are others out there um juto is a windows only tool that i hear is very good um but, you know, unless you really need something fancy, like you, most people for novels don't need some fancy whiz-bang formatting. Um, so Vellum, those tools are perfectly good. Um, there are also free temp, free um, formatting tools available at draft to digital and Readsy. Uh, Readsy's, I think, is a little nicer looking, but they're both very good. Uh, and if you're publishing books on draft to digital anyway to reach you know, wide stores, you can use it. You can use their formatter regardless of whether you're publishing with them. Okay, great. I think we've got all the questions. So if anyone else has anything else, we've got a few minutes left. So feel free to drop any last minute questions in the chat. I'll just give people a couple of seconds just to make sure we've got everything. Awesome. Thanks for coming today, everyone. I, I hope this was beneficial for you. Yeah. What do I wish I'd known at the beginning? Oh, gosh, <laughs> how much time do we have? Oh, my God, I could go for another hour about that, probably. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about a big thing, uh, Nikki, that I wish I'd known at the beginning. Oh, two, um, have an email list would be number two. Um, number one would be know your audience. Um, my first nine books were mysteries uh, before I wrote my first thriller. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, CT was uh, 28 as the series opened. So I, you know, I figure, oh, you know, I'm writing these adventure stories with this dashing young protagonist who, you know, curses and drinks and womanizes and all of this. And so I figured my target reader is obviously going to be, you know, men who are my age or so who love to, you know, drink and curse and corrals and punch evildoers in the face. Not at all. In fact, uh, yeah. completely wrong. Um, I did a survey of my readers um, through my mailing list. I just, I did like a little Google form with a few questions on it. And I learned that the average reader was older than me, much older in many cases, and two thirds of them were women. So this, you know, 40 year old man who goes to the bar and, you know, punches the drunk at the end was actually not my uh, ideal reader. And <laughs> so, yeah, and 
maybe that also brought about some of the tonal shift uh, in the book and the little softening of the hard edges of the CT character as I realized I was writing for the wrong audience, you know, three or four books in. Um, but yeah, if you know your audience at the beginning, um, and when I started writing and seriously moving towards publication in 2015, 2016, um, I don't think there was as much information out there about who the typical readers are for various genres. I mean, even young adult books. I mean, people who are plenty of adults read young adult books. Um, so yeah, know, know who your audience is. Yeah, great advice. Still got time for a couple more. So uh, Rosemary asks, which books are currently on your reading list? Uh, I am currently reading one of the books I showed on that psychological thriller slide, The Housemaid. Uh, that's my current ebook read. Uh, I generally do one ebook and one audiobook at the same time. And my audiobook is um, Burning Bright by Nick Petrie, or Petrie. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. Uh, it's uh, the second book in his Peter Ash thriller series. Um, Gene in the chat has asked, do I have one editor or do I work with multiples? Uh, I am lucky enough that I have worked with the same editor throughout uh, since I started publishing in 2017. Um, I think he's retired from uh, trad publishing. So um, I'm, I'm hoping he doesn't retire from this. Um, I, did, uh, I did use one other editor um, just because you, know, you have to do things like succession plan. And I've been employer contractor for a long time and continuity of operations is, is important. Um, so for a short story that I wrote, I used um, a different editor that I know um, just to see how the experience was working with someone else. And if this is someone I could work with um, in the event that my regular editor retires. Uh, thankfully, he hasn't said he's going to yet. And I hope he has many more years of doing this. Um, but just, you know, for continuity of operations purposes, I wanted to see how that was. But Otherwise, yes, one editor the whole time, and I think he's been great. Um, thank you, Nikki. Um, Ingrid asks, what is your publication route? Uh, assuming you mean like indie, trad, um, I've been indie all the way since I started. Um, I, I, I guess you could say I'm hybrid because I have an audio contract with Cantor for two of my thrillers. Um, but I otherwise, I, I have been indie. Uh, I would accept a traditional contract for books, but the the contract I would accept is perhaps not the contract they would offer. Let's say, um, I, I know what I've I know how much I can make doing it myself. Um, so, you know, the usual low advance, terrible royalties. No thanks. Um, I've been indie all the way. Okay. Awesome. What do I use for distribution? Do I use direct to digital? Anna asks. Uh, I am direct to most places. I'm direct to Amazon, to Kobo, to Google Play, and to Barnes & Noble. I use direct to digital yes for Apple and for the smaller distributors and for libraries. Um, I do have a Mac, um, so I have iTunes producer, and I still don't go direct to Apple because it's a huge pain in the butt. Um, it, it's very Apple. It's very fussy. Um, and I, I love Apple. I have, a, I have a Mac. I have an iPhone. I have an Apple Watch. I'm all in on the ecosystem. But they're fussy, right? Like, and just the whole process of, of, of uploading and changing your books. Uh, and they have a web portal now so that you don't need a Mac to, to publish directly with them. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's not the best. And Apple doesn't care how you get there. Like the, some distributors care, like Kobo won't give you the promotions dashboard if you're not direct apple doesn't care uh, they have they're completely agnostic about how you put your books on their platform uh, and my business-minded marketing genius um laura asks must we learn these skills well um i i am not a marketing genius <laughs> um i i think many many authors are not business-minded you know we're creatives um and if we have a day job we're part-time creatives um, so I, I'm as business minded as um, someone in my situation can be, I guess. Uh, must we learn those skills? You probably need to learn some of them. Um, but that, that depends. Um, you know, if you, that depends on why you're doing this. Uh, if you just want to see your books in print and hold a copy in your hands and give them to your friends and family, that's terrific. Uh, in that case, no, you probably don't. Um, but if you want to sell your books to strangers, um, particularly a lot of strangers, um, then yeah, you do. 
Um, Nikki asks, besides editing, what are something I outsource? Cover design, um, because I'm a terrible artist. Those are probably the two big ones. Um, editing and cover design. I do my own formatting. Uh, I manage my own email list. Uh, I do my own marketing, such as it is. Um, I've gotten help with Facebook ads and stuff like that, but I don't outsource them. I do them myself, but I've gotten some help in the creation process. Um, but in terms of regular outsourcing, uh, editing and cover design. And I do everything else myself. I think that is fantastic. And that brings us to the top of the hour. So I'm going to wrap up. Before I do, I want to say a huge thank you to Tom for coming in and speak to us. We're seeing a lot of love in the chat. So brilliant talk. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everyone.